I was supposed to walk extra slow so Matt could get back to the, <laughs> to the sound stage. <laughs> It is wonderful to have the choir back. I appreciate it so much. And it's lovely to have Karen back, too, because she's had some vacation time as well. So, and today, I'll do my duty, and I am to read from Romans 13, verses 8 through 14. Love for the day is near. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another, for he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armors of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Thus ends the reading of the word. As is often the case, there's so much in this particular scripture, and I'm going to bounce over to uh, 1 Corinthians 13 as a, a part of trying to unpack this particular scripture, uh, both of them written by the Apostle Paul. Jesus told us that we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourself, and in order to do that, we have to love ourself with God's kind of love not a self-aggrandizing kind of love, not a selfishness kind of idolizing of the self, but to really love even ourselves as God loves us so that even loving others can be done God's way and not just another way that gratifies us. And forgiving others is hugely important. We'll talk more about that next week. But love covers all the commandments. Uh, Jesus spoke an awful lot about love. He says that love covers a multitude of sins. Love is really the basis of God's nature. But the time is urgent, and we, with a lot of the conditions in the world, this, it just makes one think, well, the, the soon return of Christ is near. It's easy to, to expect that, uh, man, we're getting close to the end times. This was written, the time is urgent, time to wake up because our salvation is near, was written by Paul close to 2,000 years ago. We should have a sense of urgency no matter what the season, no matter what the, the era or the age. A sense of urgency for people to know Jesus. And the best way we can introduce Jesus to people is to love them like Jesus loves us. And that's his call for us to, to love one another. Love does no harm to its neighbor. And some, some of you have shared that, uh, and over the years also, people have shared that sometimes neighbors aren't real <laughs> lovable. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes there can be disagreements and just... We don't click, that kind of thing. But love your neighbor. Love does no harm. At a minimum, don't harm anybody. That's kind of the minimum standard. Just don't harm anybody. Some exceptions kind of remain, perhaps. I've had physicians say that part of the difficulty of their job 
is that when somebody comes in needing some care, like they need some stitches, they have to hurt them twice before they can actually get into the healing process because if they've broken something and got scrapes, they may have to anesthetize the place first. That may be in the pinch with alcohol or something that stings and hurts to begin with. And then as they do whatever they have to do and to pluck the stuff out of the wound and whatever, uh, they have to do that. And then if they have to really numb the area, they have to stick them with a needle again before the, the place can be numbed. And so one physician is saying, oh, yeah, this is hard. You know, these, those moments are difficult to do because I have to hurt them a couple times before I, I can actually get in and do the healing. Sometimes hearing the truth is painful. Sometimes in the short term, Somebody pointing out a character flaw in us is initially painful, but it can be a part of the way that God can bring long-term healing and wholeness to us. Sometimes shaking addiction is painful in a lot of ways, physically, emotionally, relationally, personally, having to admit that one has done lots of damage. Therapy can be painful. Again, some of the medical personnel have shared that sometimes when the, the therapy is happening, and particularly with muscle, muscles and such, you have to kind of stretch things until it hurts, and then you can you made progress. And lots of times, getting healthy can be painful. But in all these cases, we're, we're saying, you know, do no harm. harm uh, love does not harm its neighbor. We know what we're talking about. We know that we're really talking about not harming someone uh, that's detrimental to their long-term health and goal. And Paul says it's time to wake up from slumber. That, well, Paul the Apostle and Paul the Hopkins. Um, I've never called you that before, I'm sorry. Paul the Hopkins. Uh, thanks for doing a great job as usual. It's time to wake up. And, and Paul the Apostle is saying that back 2,000 years ago. It's time to wake up. Get out of your slumber. And it's really a good image because it's sometimes uh, life can be easy enough, even in difficulties and tragedies and changing times, that we can just get into a, a routine. We can get into um, a good life, a comfortable life, and dwell there and seek, forget to seek God's will for us now. Uh, I ask, maybe I've mentioned this before, I ask that of uh, married couples who are getting uh, premarital counseling. I said, what does God want you two to do that you wouldn't do as single people? Why would God bring you together? What does God have in mind for you as a couple? What does God want you to do? It's easy for us just to, even in doing God's will, to get comfortable and forget to ask, okay, what next, Lord? What now? Is there a change? Is there? It's easy to get comfortable, so we need to wake up. And then it's easy to go, oh, too much, Lord, more sleep. Uh, hit the pause button, hit the snooze button. Paul says the time is urgent. Awake. Awake from your slumber. And of course, we know from tragedies like the hurricane and accidents and other things that happen, uh, we're not guaranteed any particular span of life. In some sense, every day should carry some urgency with it because we just don't really know. We're not guaranteed longer life. So even if we think, well, Jesus isn't coming right away, there's still time, there still should be a sense of urgency. Not franticness, not anxiousness, but yet a sense of urgency to reach other people with the kind of love that wins them to Jesus. John Wesley gives some advice on how to love our neighbor, and we learned this in confirmation. Just three things, he's got several versions. Do no harm do good, and love God. That's, that's the short form of it. And I really would like to put God first, love God first, because that's the basis for doing anything right. 
But do no harm at a minimum. Don't, don't harm anybody. And then do good. And of course, love God. Basic rules for living. Other places, he's, he said it like this. Do all the good you can. Some of you haven't memorized. Do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. To love like that. Paul goes on to say love is the fulfillment of the law. So I just went to 1 Corinthians 13 to see what the Bible says about love. You know it as the love chapter. And the context for this is, and we'll come back to Romans, but the context for this 13th chapter in 1 Corinthians is what comes before. In chapter 12, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church about how mightily the Holy Spirit is working in and through their church. And there are miracles going on. There are prophecies by the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's power. There are gifts. There's knowledge. There, the Lord is really working mightily in that church. And he's instructing them on the proper order as they come together as the Holy Spirit moves. How do you, how do you hold church like that? And in the midst of instructing them, he says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, but let me show you, then he starts out with a more excellent way. And ta begins talking about love. If I can do all these things but don't have love, I'm nothing. If I can get all this stuff and have wisdom and knowledge and prophecy and just, it's all nothing without love. So when Paul back in Romans is writing about love, he's writing about the essentialness of love. And if we go down through the 13th chapter of 1 uh, Corinthians, you know it well. It starts, you know, love is patient. And already most of us are in trouble. Um, <laughs> but patience isn't just enduring. Oh boy, here's mine for the day, you know. Patience is more prayerful. It's more active. It's a more trusting God's plan, maybe especially when it doesn't feel like it, uh, to trust, trust and uh, kind of always, all these all have a sense of keeping the big picture in mind. Love is kind. Again, do no harm. Everybody is somebody that is precious to Jesus. Even when they're doing bad stuff, Jesus is still trying to reach them, and it may be through you in working with them. No envy. Be content. No boasting. Don't be boastful. It's not boasting. It's not prideful. Remember that God is your audience. And this is really hard for us, I think, in our country, but I think it's universal. God is your audience. What other people think of you ultimately is not the question. God is your audience. Rejoice in how he works in and through you and give God the glory, but you don't need to build yourself up. God's the one that does that. Dave Ramsey, in his uh, Financial Peace University sessions, talks about when he first didn't have a handle on this and wasn't really walking with the Lord, uh, he got himself a jaguar because he could. And he says, you know, and I, I became the jaguar. And he goes through this whole little thing and he says, why do you want a jaguar? Why did I want a jaguar? So that when I pull up to a st stoplight and next to a stranger, I can go, yeah. And the guy goes, ooh, yeah. That's a stranger. Why do I need a jaguar to impress a stranger? You know, how pathetic is that? I don't even know them. What do, what in me is so empty that I need a stranger's thumbs up at the stoplight because I got this thing? God is our audience, and that's what counts. No pride, that's what got Satan in trouble. Love is not rude. Somebody has said, I've seen this several different places, 
but somebody can say, I, I can really see your Christianity, or I can really know who you are by how you treat the waiter or the waitress, or anybody that's serving you at the time. I mean, you may be paying for that service, but how you treat the waiter or the waitress really speaks to who you are. That says, that says a lot. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. Uh, Self-centeredness is not God's way because it easily justifies evil. A retired pastor said to me one time, and I just remembered this forever. He says, Bob, I have a high tolerance for other people's pain. And that was an admission that he needs Jesus to help him as he relates to people. He says, I have a high tolerance for other people's pain. Uh, I, that's a sense of I, I just don't care or they just need to buck up, you know, and it's easy, it's easy to think people aren't hurting as much as they are or don't have needs like they do. And uh, he was a good man. Um, love keeps no record of wrongs. No healing or real health is going to happen if we're keeping that record of wrongs. Well, it goes on. Uh, doesn't delight in evil, rejoices in the truth. Love rejoices in the truth. Open to it, embraces it. Love always protects, though we do hear things like, uh, please don't be a helicopter parent. Uh, don't, don't, don't hover too closely. Uh, we were told that when Matthew went to, to college. You know, you're not going to be able to hear, you know, the different groups that get up and say for the health group and everything, you know, they're adults. Uh, we'll take care of things. You may not hear everything about what's going on because that's their choice, but don't hover too close. Protect. Help people save face. Help people come to Jesus, but don't, don't enable, don't overdo it. Always hopes, no matter what. Gosh, always perseveres. Only with God's help can we deal with situations that are overwhelming. And as, as I was writing these things down, I immediately thought of the, you know, the hurricane situations where people have just lost everything. Uh, and, you know, it's easy for us to say, well, but it's just possessions. And, you know, and of course some people have died, and that kind of cuts away that thing where they're safe too. Uh, but that's devastating. That's, that's overwhelming. Some folks, knowing they don't have a place to go back to anymore. I talked with a person the other day, a stranger to me, just going through, you know, in the last year I've lost this person, that person. I, can't, I think it was like four or five people in the last two years, close relatives, and now uh, their daughter was in the hospital in desperate shape. And it's just like, I can't lose this one. And praying for some comfort because they just can't handle another loss. Um, it says love always perseveres and love never fails. And the only way that can be true is if we're trusting God in the midst of our circumstances. Because it always comes up, well, I, I heard that God doesn't give us any more than we can handle. And of course, they're feeling like, I can't handle this already, and I can't handle another loss. And I said, no, it, really the best way to understand that is there's all kinds of stuff that's overwhelming for us, but God will help us through. With God... We can make it. It'll still be overwhelming. It'll still be confusing. It'll still hurt. It'll still be hard. And God will help us through. Love never fails. Go back to Romans. Wake up. Put aside the deeds of darkness. This is you have to do this. I have to do this. We get God's help to do it, but there's that active part on us. We can't just sit back and say, okay, God, bring on the light, and then we go off and keep doing what we're doing. Change me, transform me, and then just never put any effort into stopping things we need to stop or begin doing things we need to do. 
we, there's a, a component where we participate, we partner with God in this. So wake up, don't hit the snooze button. <laughs> it's a great image. Don't hit the snooze button on God. He's got things he wants to do. Put on that armor light. Again, it's the light that God works in you. We can't conjure it up. We can't make it happen. But it's what God does in us, but we have to put it on. You catch that connection, that balance? God's going to do stuff in you, amazing stuff, and change you and transform you and then bring you to be somebody that makes a good difference in the community. And you've got to work with him to get it done. You've got to participate. And same uh, over in Ephesians, Paul's going to talk about the armor of God, putting on the full armor of God. This he calls the armor of light. It's really the same thing. In Ephesians, he's talking about going into spiritual battle in prayer. Here he's talking about working with our neighbors in the physical sense and putting on that armor of light so that we can be a good, godly influence. If you start to resemble those 1 Corinthians 13 uh, characteristics of love, patient and kind and not rude and not boastful and all those things, uh, then you know that armor of light is being, you're being enveloped in it and it's beginning to radiate from you with that Christ-like character. And then I'll leave you with this. He, he says, ends up with, do not think how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. That's hard in our society with all the stuff we're inundated with, uh, things that come up so quickly. If you're watching TV and you're watching the, uh, the Hawkeyes beat the Cyclones, sorry. Um, <laughs> and then a commercial comes on. I know we've got Cyclone fans, too. It was a great game, by the way. Cyclones did themselves proud. Um, but you're watching TV, and then all of a sudden an ad for something comes up. And it's like, I can't believe that that ad is on at this time of day for a family event. Sometimes you can't help but see these things, but don't think how to gratify the desires. Sometimes you can't help but have a thought or a temptation but don't then entertain that idea. Don't think about how I'm going to gratify that desire, or even though I know I'm not going to do that, you start fantasizing about, well, but, you know, don't do it. Say no. But sometimes that, that seems like kind of a, oh, yeah, right, just say no. Um, but to some extent, you have to just say no. <laughs> Don't let the temptation in. It can knock at your door, but you don't have to let it in. It can knock at your door, but you don't have to say, oh, yeah, come on in. Let's, let's talk about this. I'm strong enough. I can deal with this. Let's just have a seat. Sit down. Would you like something to drink? Let's chat. Let's get to know each other. And Paul is saying, don't do that. Don't entertain. Don't dwell on. Don't think about evil things. Because pretty soon you're going to be doing them because you're thinking about how you can or, hmm, maybe that wouldn't be so bad or how maybe, uh, I, maybe it's, that's okay. He said, don't do it. Don't even let them in the door. I was riding my bicycle outs outside Iowa City one time when I was finishing up school down there, and I was riding my bike, and I can't believe the situation. Uh, I was out in the country, and a guy rode up. I think we were kind of at a crossroads and a stop sign. And rolls down the window. You want to smoke some pot? And I said, no, thanks. And then we, we drove off. That's weird. Um, but I, I thought afterwards, why did I say thanks? <laughs> no, th but thank you for tempting me. <laughs> Thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, break the law and ruin my life. Thanks. I appreciate that temptation. That was weird. I guess I'm just polite. But we shouldn't be saying no. You know, just, just say no. Don't do it. Plan ahead of time that you're not going to do that. T situations like that are where it gets hard because you can be with some people and then all of a sudden... Somebody does something and you don't have time to reason it through. You just have, had, you've had to have already made your decision. Because, you know, that, 
like that situation. That was out in the country. If I'd had the desire to do it, you know, nobody was really watching. It was out there. He's a stranger. He doesn't know me. I don't know him. And why he offered it to me, I have no idea. But you have to have decided ahead of time not to do this stuff. So don't entertain those ideas. Don't, don't welcome them. Say no. And the idea is, clothe yourselves in Christ. He makes the difference. We stumble. We fall. It's beyond our ability to do, but with Christ, it can happen. Wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. The time is now. Let's be all in for Jesus. This world needs it. Needs us to be loving. Let's pray. Gracious God, we need you. Bottom line, we need your transformation. We need help loving our neighbors. Forgive us when we don't do it well, but help us be people that are available to you to reach our neighbors in whatever way you so desire. It's a privilege to serve you. Help us, Lord, as we clothe ourselves with your light. Fill us to overflowing with your light. Help us be ready and willing. Do what it takes to become children of light. Help us as a church to be uh, right here in Clinton, a place of your light, people of your light. May we minister your love to others by your grace and by your power. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand for the closing. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Go in his grace and in his strength. Be transformed and be transforming by his grace and his power. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.